Hey, 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 good afternoon. I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com, portfolio manager here at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management and at the Tatro Wealth Advisor Group. Great to have you today. What are we today? Thursday, May 21st, 2020, uh, 3 p.m. Central Time, 4 p.m. Eastern. Great day here. We've had a good week in the markets. I'm really excited about our guest today. I'm bringing in a, uh, an actual tax partner, a lawyer uh, at, uh, I think, Western Canada's, I want to say Western Canada's largest law firm or one of the largest law firms in Western Canada. We're going to talk about some basic uh, tax corporate structuring strategies, some basic ones. We're also going to talk about some high, higher level strategies. And then we're going to talk about some strategies that you can use now uh, if you own a corporation, if you own, you know, maybe you own your own corporation or you're, you're incorporated or you got a hold co op co. What's some of the strategies that he's seeing right now? Really excited about this convo because I'm a, I'm a deep believer that we need to be, you know, in our, in my practice, we do need to be giving this type of advice. Most of the people we work with are, are either business owners or have affiliations with businesses and business owners. So uh, it's great to be it's great to be partnering with someone like uh, Mike Ziesman today to be giving you this advice. I'm thrilled. Before we get to him and before we get to the market headlines, uh, let's run that disclaimer again to remind you that we're not here to give you advice. All right. Thanks for that. Producer Mox. Appreciate that. So uh, I do want to bring in our guest. I'll bring him in right away. Him and I'll chat a bit about some of the headlines making news today uh, to, uh, you know, I'm not going to wait any longer. I'll bring him right in. Partner, tax partner at MLT Aikens, uh, Mike Ziesman. Been with Aikens now for, I don't know what, like 12 years or something? That's uh, a guess. Coming up on 10. 10 years. All right. Uh, we, I think we would have just, I would have just missed you when I was there back at Aikens. Thanks for being here today, Zeesman. How uh, I should say, Mike, how are things uh, going in your world today? You're at, you're at the office. I could tell. I'm, uh, I'm at the office. Uh, things are going, going well. The uh, interesting thing about tax work is that uh, it needs to be done whether, you know, markets are good or markets are bad or regardless what's happening in the economy. So, um, you know, I've been kept I've been kept fairly busy over the last few months. Good, happy to hear that. Uh, are most of the partners at Aikens kind of going into the office every day, or are you kind of the exception? Uh, we've got uh, so we've got a number of people that have been coming in routinely. A lot of people coming in kind of a couple times a week just to uh, keep tabs on what's going on. Uh, the nice thing about this profession, though, is that uh, it's quite easy to work remotely if if you'd like. So. Uh, we've we've had a, a mix of people doing different things. Okay, Dow Jones fell about a hundred points today. Uh, closed right around twenty four thousand. I'll say four seventy or so. Uh, down about uh, you know forty basis points. The S and P five hundred down twenty three points. So that's three quarters of a percent. Nasdaq down almost a full percent. Some of those tech stocks falling a little bit lately. I think that's likely on the news that we saw some jobless reports. I don't know if you saw this headline, uh, Mike, but another 2.4 million people um, applied for jobless claims benefits in the U.S. That brings the total number to 38 million Americans applied for benefits in the U.S. That's a lot of lost jobs. There's about 155 million people gainfully employed in the U.S. Well, before this, and now a quarter of them have applied for unemployment benefits. Are you kind of seeing that in your friends and family or is, are you surprised to see those numbers? So, uh, I mean, huge numbers, um, and, and I think it's hard to hard to fathom just how big this is. Uh, you know, fortunately, most of my family has uh, uh, come through this relatively unscathed, but uh, certainly feel very badly for anybody that's on the uh, you know that's had the opposite experience. Yeah, we've also seen a big rally this week, uh, 900 points on Monday. The, the Dow was up 900 points on Monday. We were closed, obviously, because Canada's a long weekend. Uh, so we saw 900 points on Monday. A lot of news about reopening of the economy is kind of spurring this development and this buying that's happening in the stock market, in my uh, humble, respectful opinion. And, you know, what I'm reading online, uh, wh what do you take of this kind of reopening more south of the border, I would say, than, I mean, in Winnipeg? For those of you who aren't in Winnipeg, um, what have we had, like one case in the last two weeks or something like that? So um, I can kind of see that argument. What do you think of the, the reopening argument in the States? And then I want to ask you about sports. What do you think is going to happen to sports? Uh, so in terms of reopening, I, I think it's getting to the point where a lot of people are having trouble with the idea of staying home any longer. And, and um, I know it's 
this has gone a lot more poorly in the U.S. than it, was, than it has here. But um, I, I think people are kind of anxious to get back to whatever normal will be going forward. Uh, and so, so I, I understand the desire that people have to, to maybe move forward with reopening. Uh, sports can't come back soon enough for me, though, because, uh, you know, I'm certainly a big hockey guy. I was disappointed to see that the CFL season has been, I guess, postponed until September if it, if it goes ahead at all. Um, but I was kind of looking forward to watching the Bombers defend their, uh, their Grey Cup this year. You know what? Apologies, we got our parade. apologies to anybody in Saskatchewan, but uh, <laughs> we got our parade. I'm good. You know, I'm kind of like been waiting for this for 30 years or whatever for our Great Cup, and I'm good. I'm 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 fine to take a, a few months off from CFL. Uh, you watched the Last Dance? Oh my goodness, how good was that, Michael Jordan? I, I have I have not watched that. Oh, uh, if only watch. because um, I would have a tough time convincing my wife to watch that uh, in the evening. So Fair I'll enough. have to. Uh, I'll have to find some time on my own to watch that. Another headline here, the last one I want to chat about before moving on to uh, ask you some about some tax questions, but uh, oil, I'm not sure if you've been following the price of oil, but it hit a bit of a, like I, I want to say a two month high today, uh, closed right around, um, where do we close? Right around 34 bucks or something like that. So uh, it's been rallying quite a bit up another percent and a half today. That is now six or seven consecutive days, positive news. We've come a long way from the negative $37 barrel of oil. That was only one month ago. That was a month and two days ago, we had minus $37 barrel of oil. And today we're at plus 34. We've had a $71 barrel of oil swing here in four weeks. Um, you, you know, did you, I think you were mentioning earlier, you were driving and you saw the, the oil price or the gas prices up in Winnipeg. Yeah. Uh, so the, the cheap prices were good while they lasted, I guess. What had never crossed my mind when I was reading about, you know, that uh, kind of some of the oil pricing is, uh, you know, there's a capacity issue, right? And and this has to be stored once it's extracted. And, uh, you know, as, as obvious as it sounds, that had never really crossed my mind as being something that would drive the price down. It's the classic case. We we covered it in our, on our show here a couple of times. I, I, I did one episode with my dad on this, the classic long squeeze, the opposite of a short squeeze. If you want to, if you want to catch that uh, clip, really, really good. My dad's a, an act. I, you know, I think the smartest guy on the planet when it comes to this stuff, we talked about that specific situation on one of our shows. You by all means go back and check it out. It was a neat, neat show. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, tax and specifically organizing yourself if you own a business. Mike, these are the types of people you deal with. You deal with business owners on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, why would someone incorporate their business? So there's there's a few reasons why somebody might look at incorporating. Um, you know, the answer that any other lawyer would give you is you want to do that to limit li your liability. Um, you know, corporations are treated as separate persons at law. Therefore, if there is a lawsuit against a business that's incorporated, that insulates the shareholders from any any claim. So yeah. that's kind of the, the traditional legal reason. So I'm a plumber. I have a, a plumbing company. If I screw up someone's house and you know cause millions of damages and my insurance can't cover all the losses, then they can't go after me personally. They can go after Bill's plumbing or Rob's plumbing Correct. and not Rob personally. And, and so to the extent that there are no assets left in the corporation. Uh, those creditors would be out of luck, but you know, Rob the plumber personally would not lose his house. Yeah, the company's done because they're going to clean it out in the lawsuits, but at least Rob the plumber can continue to work. Right. The, the, the kind of the reason I more often than not get involved is because corporations are tremendous tools in tax planning. And so you know, the, the, the best example I can give is, you know, the provinces that allow professionals to incorporate, whether it's doctors, dentists, lawyers. Um, under the legislation, those professions aren't entitled to limited liability through corporations for professional negligence. The only reason that they would incorporate is for tax purposes. And so there's, there's a number of, of tax benefits that come from incorporating. Uh, the big one is that if you have uh, what's called a Canadian controlled private corporation, so a uh, corporation incorporated in Canada that is not uh, controlled by foreign companies or public companies, um, 
the active business income of that corporation, the first half million dollars, is taxed at a low rate. And so in Manitoba, that's 9%. Now, so, what, what would the federal rate be on that as well? So the, the federal rate on that is the 9%. There is a 0% Manitoba provincial rate on the first half million dollars of... Your total tax is 9%. Correct. So um, again, uh, you know, picking up on a, a an incorporated physician, for example, um, if you had a physician that that earned a half million dollars through their medical corporation, the rate on that is only going to be 9%. So they pay $45,000 in tax. Way Uh, less than taking $500,000 of personal income. Exactly. Because then you pay 50.4% tax. So as they take that money out of the corporation, they pay personal tax on that. But for somebody that is earning more from their practice than they need to live personally to cover personal expenses, the the excess income that they earn can sit in their corporation, they've paid 9% tax, and you get a, a significant tax deferral on that. Mm-hmm. Um, even once you exceed that $500,000, the, the general corporate rate in Manitoba is only 27%. So uh, still significantly lower than what you would pay as an individual earning, earning that money uh, through employment. Okay, so you talked about liability. Bob the plumber doesn't want to lose his house. You talked about um, lower tax rate on an incorporated profitable company. Now, this would have to be profits from a a corporate profits, correct? Correct, yes. Okay, Um, what are some of the other reasons? You know, we talk a lot about Holdco, Opco. You know, first of all, you know, Opco, to clarify, that's the operating company. So that in our case would be Bob's Plumbing. What would a Holdco be? Describe to us what a Holdco would be. So a Holdco is a a holding company, and and essentially that is a second corporation that does nothing but own the first corporation. Um, So you would have, uh, for example, uh, ABC Inc., which carries on the plumbing business, or, or Rob's Plumbing Inc. that carries on your plumbing business. And instead of you owning Rob's Plumbing Inc. personally, you might hold it through Tetro Holdings Inc. And so the reason for that is, again, to deal with that um, liability issue, because of those lower tax rates, you might have left your surplus corporate earnings in Rob's Plumbing Inc. Um, What that hold co lets you do is take that cash out of Rob's Plumbing Inc. It can be paid as a dividend up to Tetro Holdings Inc. with no intercorporate tax and you've again kind of taken cash that would have been exposed to creditors in Rob's Plumbing Inc, moved it up to Tetro Holdings Inc on a tax-free basis and so again if there was a claim against Rob's Plumbing Inc there is no money there to satisfy that claim. Uh, Your retained earnings or your surplus cash are protected in you know Tetro Holdings Inc. we typically see I mean, when you and I kind of work on, on, you know, corporate structuring for, for a client, or, you know, if I'm giving advising a client on corporate structuring, if you get to the point where you are accumulating cash because you are making more money than you need to spend in your house. So Bob's plumbing, you know, made 500 grand last year and doesn't need 500 grand to live off of. So that means the cash is sitting in that opco that, that, that's bad for a couple of reasons, but you mentioned specifically one is creditor, but also, you know, the, the capital gains would be one of them. You know, you want to make sure you're on side. If ever you want to sell the business, if ever you want to sell Bob's plumbing, you could effectively just chop it off between Bob's plumbing and Tatro holdings. And then all the money could stay in Tatro holdings and Bob's plumbing could just be effectively sold as an operating company. Right. And, and that's another reason why um, you know, people should think about incorporating is the tax treatment on a sale of the business. So, um, you know, on the sale of corporations, assuming you meet certain criteria, uh, the shareholders are eligible for the capital gains exemption. Um, this year, that's at approximately $884,000. Um, so $884,000 worth of capital gains on your shares of uh, you know, Rob's Plumbing Inc. would be effectively exempt from Canadian income tax. Which is um, huge, which is huge. Yeah, and, and, and that number is indexed. 
Um, so that increases a little bit each year. Last year it was 866,912. So there's been about an $18,000 lift in that this year. Um, but there's a whole list of criteria that have to be met in order for a shareholder to qualify. And one of those criteria is you can't have surplus cash sitting in Rob's Plumbing Inc. before you sell it. Right. And so, you know, part of what I do is, you know, whenever somebody comes to see me about incorporating, um, already you have to be looking ahead to, to think about what's going to happen when you want to sell your business, when you want to retire, when you want to transition that business to your, your kids. So, um, I spend a lot of time developing corporate structures for people that uh, let them stay on side all of these rules while minimizing kind of current tax levels. And, and there's a whole bunch of different things you can do. Holding companies are one uh, where you can move the cash out of Rob's plumbing. Um, family trusts are another that let you move money around on a tax efficient basis to kind of allow you to continually flush that cash out of Opco where it could be subject to creditor claims or it could interfere with your ability to uh, eventually claim that capital gains exemption on the sale of the business. Okay. Yeah. I, you know, I think that is such a huge point and one that I often see in one piece of advice that I, I think is incredibly valuable for individuals out there who maybe aren't aware of this. Uh, again, as a reminder, I'm Rob Tatro here. I'm here with Mike Ziesman, tax partner at MLT Akins. Today, we're talking about corporate structure. We're talking about tax strategies. We're talking about right now, we're covering kind of the basics of organizational structure uh, in your corporations. And the, the the situation of seeing a couple build their corporation for their whole life, accumulate, a, you know, sell their business for a couple million, and then have to pay the tax because they didn't qualify for the small business capital gains exemption. That is just devastating on a couple because you end up writing a $500,000 check, right? On, on 2 million bucks. It's roughly 25 basis points, you know, roughly a quarter of it disappears to tax. So critical, critical that you qualify and you meet the exemptions for the capital gains exemption. That's something that you would help. Uh, you and I would be helping clients with. Um, you talked about family trusts. W where do you see family trusts in 2020 with the recent changes uh, that the Trudeau government brought? Was it two years ago now, a year ago? Yeah, so the, there's still some value to family trusts. Um, back in the summer of 2017, there was a, a you know, fairly significant shift in tax policy. And, um, you know, the government came out with, with, uh, a number of changes to that impacted what I would have considered very um, kind of ordinary vanilla and long-standing tax planning techniques. Um, Ooh, big words from Mike Zeisman. <laughs> He's calling out. Uh, one one of those was um, you know it it impacted your ability to use family trust to. Uh, pay dividends to family members who might not be active in the business and, and uh, to take advantage of different people's marginal tax rates. So maybe um, just to clarify one sec here, uh, Mike, uh, a family trust is another legal entity. It's a trust that's established where you can kind of pick the beneficiaries. You could pick who you want to distribute. It's typically always discretionary. So, you know, if, if I were to set up a family trust, you know, my wife and I would be trustees and we could pick who we give the money to, who we give the profits of the corporations to. Typically, the trusts uh, would own shares uh, of the corporations or whatever the structure might be, but it's another separate legal entity. And now you're talking about uh, using marginal tax advantages. So, you know, that would be like using my kids, for example, if they're adults or whatever that may be. Right. So, to kind of loop back to the, the Rob's Plumbing Inc. example, um, instead of Rob owning the shares or Tetro Holdings owning the shares, um, my my preferred structure is to have a family trust own those shares. And the reason is because family trusts provide a lot of tax planning flexibility. So a family trust would let you do things like uh, 10 years down the road, if your son wants to get involved in the business, uh, the trust could generally give your son some shares in the business uh, without triggering any tax. So if the trust held 100 shares, and you wanted to make your son a 25% shareholder in the plumbing business, the trust could just transfer 25 shares to your son. And that generally happens on a tax deferred basis. So your son would effectively inherit the trust cost base in those shares and, and wouldn't pay tax on any gains until your son sold them. Um, 
what trusts were often used for though is uh, you would leave all the shares in the trust and as Rob's Plumbing Inc. Pay, paid dividends up to the trust, the trustees of that trust who manage the property and make the decisions could decide that um, you know, we've received a $100,000 dividend from Rob's Plumbing Inc. We're going to allocate $25,000 of that to Rob, $25,000 to Rob's wife and $25,000 to two of Rob's kids. Um, the other two are out. The other two are out. Maybe you know. Maybe they did something that upset you, um, or maybe they they had other sources of income that wouldn't make that as good a planning technique. But what people were doing is using family trusts in that manner because each of those beneficiaries would be subject to tax on that dividend at their own marginal tax rate. So somebody that's not earning any other income, for example, a university student. A, uh, a spouse that that kind of doesn't carry on uh, paid employment, but instead is a uh, you know homemaker, looks after children, looks after the home. Um, you could pay dividends to that person, rely on their marginal tax rate, and pay very little tax taking that hundred thousand dollars out of Rob's plan. Plumbing. Yeah, the, the yeah. idea is basically the idea is basically you know in this case my two kids are university students so they're they got zero tax so I'm going to instead of having it at my tax bracket and, and you know I'm a I'm a high earning plumber they would get the first twenty grand or thirty grand of income and you know they would pay almost no tax on that right so up up until three years ago that was the common uh, use for trusts um, that planning technique was was wiped out um, with the July 2017 proposed legislation that was that was ultimately enacted. So, um, you know, that benefit of family trust has been taken away. Um, what I now like to use family trust for, um, one, if you were to sell or if the trust were to sell its shares of Rob's plumbing, uh, there still is the ability to allocate the capital gain out to all of those beneficiaries, and you can use all of those beneficiaries' capital gains exemptions. So um, rather than the $884,000 limit for just you, Rob, um, you know, if you've got a spouse and four kids, that's six capital gains exemptions that can be used. And so my math skills aren't great. So let's assume that it was a $900,000 capital gains limit. Um, you've managed to shelter $5.4 million worth of capital gain by using the trust to multiply that exemption. That, so, is, that one cannot be understated, Mike, because people, I, I often hear people say trusts are out the window. I often people hear say that, and I've heard it in the past, you know, several years. Oh, I did all this tax planning, it's out the window. I'd say, I call BS on that because just that exemption, if you're going to be selling your business for more than one capital gains exemption, there, there's your, there's your cost of your trust right there, right? There it is. Yeah. So that's, that's still a very valuable um, benefit to trusts. The other thing I like to use them for is rather than just have your individual family members as beneficiaries, I like to include a corporation. And again, the, the benefit of that is that money can then flow from uh, Rob's Plumbing Inc. to Rob's Trust and then out to the corporate beneficiary um, on a tax-free basis. And so it, it, it's very similar to the Holdco structure but it, it's done in a way that's not going to, um, again, cause problems with qualifying for that capital gains exemption in the future. So cash is kind of moved out of your operating company through the trust into the corporate beneficiary, and it's protected there. And you're left with a, uh, you know, what tax people like to call a clean operating company that, that doesn't have any uh, passive assets in it. You guys are so good at doing that. It's crazy. Like I, 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 I enjoy sitting down with you and just chatting about some of these. Now, these are basic strategies that you'd call basic. Um, I'd call kind of advanced already. Um, but some of the stuff you guys are doing, guys, if you're watching this on YouTube, please take a sec to subscribe to our channel. I think this is great content. If you're watching this on Facebook, please take a second uh, to like and follow and, and you know give us a comment or a reshare. Uh, this is incredibly valuable content, in my opinion. If you're out there and you're watching and you want to ask Mike, a question specific to your situation, by all means, the comments are open. We'd love to hear from you. Um, 
you know, so there you have it from Mike. Trusts are not dead. Uh, they, they definitely still have some uses for them. We still see them uh, from time to time. Now, uh, a, a term I, I often hear, an estate freeze. Do you mind just kind of going through what an estate freeze is and what why it would be useful? Sure. So an estate freeze, again, is a very common transaction implemented um, by tax lawyers in consultation with tax accountants. Um, and so let's say that Rob's plumbing was wildly successful and your accountant tells you that, hey, Rob, you've built this business up. Um, it's worth a million dollars now. Um, and you think it's going to continue to increase in value as you know time goes on because you know, you're becoming better known in the, in the plumbing industry. Um, what an estate freeze is, uh, effectively is it's it's looking ahead to what the tax consequences are going to be as a result of your death. So when somebody passes away in Canada, the general rule is that something like shares of a business would be deemed to be disposed of immediately before death. So if Rob's plumbing is worth $5 million at the time that you pass away, you have this deemed disposition of these shares that are now valued at $5 million and you've triggered a $5 million capital gain. Um, you know, if you can claim your capital gains exemption against that, great. But if not, you're looking at a tax bill of about $1.25 million. So what an estate freeze and does you might be, is, Mike, you might be in a position if, if your kids are handling your estate or your spouse is handling your estate, there might not be 1.25 million of cash right yes. there that day yeah. to write a check to, to, you know, our government to pay for that, for that income. So if you can avoid it, I mean, plan for it through insurance or avoid it through an estate freeze, which you're, which you're describing now, go ahead. Sorry. So what an estate freeze is. Um, at some point between the time that you start Rob's Plumbing and the time that you pass away, um, you might take your common shares of Rob's Plumbing and exchange them for preferred shares that have a value equal to the value of the corporation at the time of the freeze. So if you were to do this once Rob's Plumbing was worth a million dollars, we would take your common shares and we would give you a million dollars worth of fixed value preferred shares that don't increase in value. And so you've you've frozen the value of your interest in the corporation at a million dollars. It will never go above that. We could then have your kids come in and, and buy new common shares for um, a nominal amount of money, $10. Any future growth above that million dollars of value would accrue to your kids' shares. You're pushing it down the line, basically. Right. Or, or a family trust. Uh, but what that means is that when you pass away, instead of triggering a $5 million capital gain, you're only triggering a $1 million capital gain because that's the value of, of your shares at the time of the estate freeze. It truly is a freeze. At that point in time, you are freezing the capital gain and you are deciding what capital gain you will pay on death. And then typically, if you're working with a guy like me, you would plan for that. You'd be like, okay, we know in this case, we got a million dollar liability, tax liability on death. We know that, you know, there's not going to be a million dollars of cash sitting around. So, you know, in that case, we would likely plan for insurance uh, for for Rob if he's healthy and insurable in this case. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that. Okay, a reminder here, I'm here with uh, Mike Ziesman, tax partner uh, at MLT Aikens LLP. Today, we're discussing uh, a little bit of some advanced tax strategies. Uh, we're going to talk a bit about some of the strategies that you've seen during COVID. Maybe we could start with there. Some of the stuff that you've seen in COVID recently that might apply to business owners. What are you seeing come across your desk? So just to, uh, I guess, continue on our estate freeze discussion, one of the things that we're actually seeing now is people doing estate refreezes. So let's say that two years ago, you'd done an estate freeze of Rob's Plumbing and you issued yourself a million dollars worth of shares. Um, if the business has declined in value now, you might have an opportunity to say that those shares are actually no longer worth a million dollars because the corporation as a whole is worth less than a million dollars. And we can take those shares and exchange them again into shares that represent the current value of Rob's plumbing. And so again, it's taking advantage of the current uh, business market to you know, reflect the fact that Rob's plumbing is no longer worth a million dollars. So we exchange your million dollars worth of shares for shares that are worth less. 
and that's going to reduce the the capital gain resulting from the deemed disposition on your death. When you're doing these, Mike, you're obviously using a, a sort of a business valuator and and they're going to look at multiples and comparables. And, and that's, you know, you're not just picking a number out of the air and saying, you know, this company's worth less for, for those size of, of deals. You're using a CBV, right? Yeah. So, so there's, you know, in order for the, uh, you know, and, and all of this is done on a tax free basis. There's no tax triggered in any of these transactions. But one of the important things to make sure that that you're not going to be uh, causing a tax problem is you have to have a legitimate valuation. And, and so that can involve a CBV in some cases. Um, in some cases, it instead relies on the corporation's accountant and, and you know what they've seen other businesses in the sector uh, trading at. Um, you know, in the case of a an investment holding corporation, it can be as simple as looking at the market value of, you know, the stock portfolio in the corporation. Um, and, and then maybe, maybe applying some discount for what it would cost to liquidate and move money out. So um, it, it is important that there is, um, you know, some, some real bona fide effort that goes into figuring out what that value is. It's, it's not just picking a convenient number and, you know, We'll say it's worth a million dollars because it's a it's an impressive number. It's a nice round number. There has to be an effort into figuring out the true value. Fair enough. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, let's talk about best ways that you've seen or stuff you're seeing now to get money out of the corp. So there, yeah, there's there's a number of things that we're seeing um, you know, from very basic to more advanced kind of uh, comprehensive planning. Um, so at the basic level. Um, you know, if your corporation has what's called a capital dividend account, that can be used to pay out dividends tax-free to the shareholders. Um, so capital dividend account is a, a notional tax account. There isn't actually money sitting in there. It's it's something that's tracked by the CRA. And again, it's, it's money that can be paid out to shareholders on a tax-free basis. And there's a couple of things that go into that. Um, one is the non-taxed portion of capital gains. So uh, you've you've mentioned, and, and I'm sure a lot of your uh, viewers will know that uh, only half of a capital gain is taxed. So if you earn a profit of a thousand dollars selling shares, uh, you only actually pay tax on five hundred of that. The other, the the five hundred dollar non-taxable portion gets credited to this capital dividend account and can be paid out to the shareholders of the corporation tax free. So again, that's something that it's very easily done. Um, usually accountants are mindful of that, that once your capital dividend account gets to a certain level, they'll, they'll make sure that it's flushed out to shareholders. Um, but not always, I've, I've seen some clients that, um, that without any of their own knowledge have built up some sizable capital dividend accounts and, and had the ability to extract uh, significant sums through that, that they weren't even aware that they could take out. And usually you would, you would want to pull it out because like, it, let's say you're sitting on a million bucks in your CDA account and that's cash sitting in whatever account that you have, the income that is being generated by that million bucks is, is taxed at the highest tax rate, right? So you would want to pull it out at least so that maybe once you pull it out, it's taxed at a lower rate personally, potentially, than it is there, plus liability, plus, plus, plus. It's always good to have money in your personal name. You know, it's out, it's after tax, it's in your hands. You know, they, they can't touch it, they can't come back to it. It's yours, it's out, it's it's, it's free and clear, as they say. So I'm, I'm a big believer in pulling out CDA. And we typically work with accountants. We'll often get accountants to be like, hey, there's 200 grand there in the CDA, let's pull it out and then we'll execute a third party transfer for our clients to move the money out from their corporation to their personal name. And we'll typically help clients execute that as you were talking about. I think I think it's important to do. Yeah. Um, the next, next possibility is if your corporation has what's called a general rate income pool and, and that's money that has been taxed at the... Uh, uh, the general corporate rate of 27% in Manitoba. Um, so, uh, you know, money that you've earned beyond the small business limit. Um, so that comes out as taxable to the shareholders, but at a 
more favorable rate than uh, other dividends. So the top tax rate in Manitoba on uh, eligible dividends, which are paid from the corporation's GRIP account, is uh, slightly under 38% if you're somebody in the top tax bracket. Um, that's in contrast to uh, non-eligible dividends, which would be sourced from income that was taxed at that small business rate of 9%. In Manitoba, you're looking at a top tax rate of, of 46 and two third percent on, on that. So again, if, if you've got money to come out of the corporation uh, and you've got a capital dividend account balance, fantastic, that comes out tax-free. If you've got a grip balance or general rate income pool, that comes out at a, uh, a more favorable rate and kind of as a last resort would be taking out non-eligible dividends, which can be taxed up to 46.67% in Manitoba. Hey guys, we're here again with uh, Mike Zeisman, tax partner at MLT Akins. You're dropping a lot of numbers and a lot of facts and a lot of stuff, and you might be losing some of our viewers. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm following. But uh, if you are confused by all this, guys, and if you want to, you know, go to a, you'd like to book a no obligation consultation with me, please go to www.speaktorob.com. Uh, Zeisman, I want to, uh, sorry, I should say Mike. I call you Zeisman from time to time when we're, uh, when we're at a Jets game or something. But when we do, uh, I do want to get to some kind of further tax planning strategies. Uh, but before I get to that, I think we do have uh, your contact info at the bottom. If someone wants to reach out to you, they could just go to the MLT Aikens website and, and uh, or, or take a look at uh, your profile there. Tax partner at MLT Aikens. Thanks for joining us. So we talked about the best one, best way to get money out of the corp. Anything else that we missed on that front? So just looping back to the capital dividend uh, account and, and, you know, something you're probably well aware of, Rob, the other thing that goes into that is um, insurance proceeds that are received from uh, life insurance policies. So again, um, usually people are on the ball in terms of paying that out of the corporation, but that's another, that's one other aspect of what goes into the capital dividend account. Yeah. You've you um, got to make sure you don't screw that one up. So you know, whether you're paying out a capital dividend or an eligible dividend, those are, are very simple things to do. Um, then we get into some more complex planning that we're seeing. Um, so one of the things that we're seeing now, um, you know, given that a lot of people's corporate income has been, uh, you know, impacted by everything going on, uh, every dollar that comes out of the corporation is, is more valuable to them. Um, so circling back to what we talked about a little bit earlier and, and some of the, the rules that would stop you from income splitting with a spouse or kids. Um, one of the things that we're doing is, is navigating around some of those rules and, and um, restructuring corporations in a way that would fall within some exceptions to those rules that are um, allowed for in the tax act. Is this the tax on split income? Correct. Yep. Okay, the, the TOSI, as you guys call it. TOSI. Um, and so, you know, simple example, um, again, going back to a, a corporation that's owned by a family trust, um, the simplest example would be um, a, a business that can fit into one of the exceptions simply by having the trust transfer 10% of its shares out to the spouse that is not active in the business. And there's there's some other criteria that have to be met, but as a most that's crazy I, I like i didn't even know that was possible I, I talk about income splitting rules all the time i talk about clients about income splitting i talk about you know the, the passive income grind but i did not know that you could get an exempt share structure and then still qualify and still be exempt from the tax on income splitting yeah and 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 so that won't work for every corporation um the uh, the rules don't allow that for professional corporations, so it doesn't work for physicians, lawyers, dentists. Um, it also, for whatever reason, the government has decided not to extend that treatment to corporations that earn the uh, you know, the bulk of their income from providing services. Um, they're worried about they're worried about loopholes, I guess. I, I think so, but. You know, if you've got something like a manufacturing business or you've got a restaurant or things like that, um, where the corporate income is earned from uh, the sale of goods, um, that strategy potentially works. Or even uh, 
you know, if you've got a corporation that's earning all of its income through investment. So if you've got an investment holding corporation that does nothing but own rental property or uh, own a portfolio of, of, you know, marketable securities, um, that planning can work for those corporations as well. And, and so you can restructure to get um, shares to your spouse and potentially qualify for this exception to the income splitting rules. So if you're currently owning a corp and you're not doing that and you've never heard of this and you wanted to do something like that, you would first need to know if you could potentially qualify. And then this is something that you would, stru- you would do a restructure or what we call a reorg for the for the the business owner who's watching right now and you could potentially figure out to see if they would qualify for the exemption for the tax on split income correct and and so the the whole purpose of that would be that you could then pay dividends to your spouse and not have them subject to tax as as if they were already in the top tax bracket so um, again in in manitoba if you did this with an investment holding company which and that allowed you to pay um, eligible dividends to a spouse with no other income. You can pay about thirty thousand dollars of eligible dividends to somebody uh, before they will pay any tax. Completely tax free, uh, thirty grand. So, so the uh, in in Manitoba, if you paid thirty thousand dollars of eligible dividends to somebody with no other income, you're looking at about two hundred and fifty dollars worth of tax on that. So this is something that doesn't just have to be for the spouse, right, Mike? You could actually be doing this with other shareholders, potentially kids with with low incomes. So in order for this to work with children, they do have to be uh, 25 or older. 25, okay. Um, But there are a few other ways to manage some of these passive income or some of the uh, split income, tax on split income rules. Um, and, And... quite often we've been able to find some sort of strategy that would provide a, a benefit for, for clients. Um, again, it's, it's usually determined on a case by case basis, but I don't think those rules now that people have had time to interpret them are as restrictive as people thought they were initially. You guys are, you especially, but you guys, you tax lawyers are so good at that. You're going to say this is not a loophole. You're going to say this isn't a loophole, Rob. This is in the rules and this is acceptable and it's made to do this, but you're good at finding solutions. Two years ago, we were complaining about tax on split income and now you've found a way around it. So good for you. And it's it's not a loophole, right, Mike? There, there is There is a defined term in the tax act of excluded shares, which are excluded from the application of these split income rules. So it's just a matter of seeing whether you can restructure to make your shares fall into that definition. So you see, I used to work with you guys at MLT Akins and I used to talk like you guys. I used to talk like this. I used to talk like a lawyer. I'm kind of glad I no longer have to talk like a lawyer, like you have to talk. Uh, man, you're, you're a very, very bright guy, Mike. Uh, I, I do want to talk about a few more things here. Um Again, a reminder, I'm here with Mike Ziesman, tax partner at MLT Akins, one of the brightest guys I know when it comes to taxes. Uh, I'm Rob Tatro from robtatro.com, portfolio manager here at Canaccord Genuity Wealth Management, the Tatro Wealth Advisor Group. Uh, If you're unsure about this or anything else you'd like to talk, please go to www.speaktorob.com. Happy to book a no obligation consultation. I want to talk a little bit of, uh, you know, multiple wills, power of attorneys, healthcare directives, who, who should have multiple wills, who should have power of attorneys. Maybe we could start with powers of attorney. What's your, what's your thought on powers of attorney? What is it, first of all, real quick, and then who should have one? So powers of attorney are documents that would allow somebody else to act on your behalf. Um, so the, the, the one example is if, you have some sort of health issue that causes you to lose mental capacity, that would allow somebody else to deal with things like uh, filing your taxes, accessing your bank accounts, making sure your property taxes are paid, um, selling your home if you're no longer able to to live there. It, it's intended to allow somebody to function in the same ways that you would and, and to carry out actions in the same way as you would um, if you had the capacity to do so. Um, I'm personally a big proponent of those documents. Um, when I meet with somebody about estate planning, um, I view those as part of a, a package that goes along with wills. Uh, they're very important documents. Um, just because a will only takes effect once somebody has passed away, 
whereas a power of attorney would be effective if somebody was alive, but uh, not able to, to manage their affairs. So if my wife and I come see you, I own Bob's Plumbing, I go, all right, let's do this reorg, let's do the estate freeze, my company's going to grow a ton. You're going to say, Rob, you should probably also do a power of attorney on the spot so that my wife and I can act on each other's behalf currently? In any any corporate restructuring, it's always a good idea to, uh, at the same time, review your personal planning, uh, whether it's estate planning, whether it's, it's even financial planning. Uh, but whenever I do a corporate reorganization for somebody, the topic of their estate planning comes up just because we don't want to go through this complex corporate reorganization and have it fall apart on the death of the principal of the business just because their estate plan hasn't been documented. Good. What about healthcare directive? So a healthcare directive, uh, similar to a power of attorney in the sense that it allows somebody else to make decisions on your behalf. Um, this is limited to healthcare decisions. So covers things like uh, consenting to treatment, um, accessing medical records, arranging for home care. Um, also covers off things uh, that that people might be more familiar with the term living will. Um, you know, in what circumstances do you want or not want medical treatment? Um, you know, do you want to direct somebody to um, not administer medical treatment if you're not likely to recover and it would not improve your your quality of life? So those things are dealt with in a, a healthcare directive. Um, I'm also a big believer in those documents. I know some people are uncomfortable with some of those things. Um, you got to so have I, the conversation though, right? You, it's better to have it now than to not have it. I always tell my clients, you know, let your executor know who, who they are, what the plans are, what's happening to the money. I actually encourage my, my clients. I don't know what you do. I actually encourage my clients at some point when they're ready to kind of you know, discuss wealth and, and it's not going to impact their kids in any way. I tell them to actually have the discussion with their kids. Here, here's where the money's going. We're leaving X percent to charity. We're leaving X percent to you guys. And, you know, this is going to be in a trust and, you know, this, you know, family foundation, whatever. And I tell them to have that discussion with the kids just to eliminate any tension or, or anything else later on. I don't know yeah, how you feel about and, that. And, and so for a number of reasons, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, where it gets interesting is where parents have made the decision for one reason or another to not leave things equally to their kids. And, and, and quite, you know, there are very valid reasons why people might do that. But if your kids are only finding out about that after you've passed away, um, I, I think naturally there tends to be some uh, hard feelings about that. Whereas, you know, if that conversation is had while the parents are alive, you know, it, it could very well be, you know, you are a you know, seven figure earning uh, physician, superstar plumber. physician, plumber. Uh, superstar plumber, um, whereas your sibling is is kind of struggling to make ends meet and has health issues. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think anybody would would, uh, again, take issue with parents decisions in, in that sort of scenario. But again, it's it's better for your children to know that while you're alive than finding out afterwards when you've passed away and there's nobody left to explain why you've done the things that you've done. Our head of wealth and estate planning, his name is Adam Buss. He's been on this show a few times for sure. And he's incredibly wise when it comes to this stuff. Uh, he always says fair is not necessarily equal, right? And we see a lot of that when it comes to, uh, you know, especially farm families or yes. agricultural backgrounds. Uh, someone might be, you know, toiling day and night on the farm and someone isn't. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's mom and dad's money and it's mom and dad's assets. So, you know fair might not necessarily be equal, but let's have the discussion is what I would advise. Yes. Um, so you've talked about POA, you've talked about healthcare directive, uh, multiple wills, is that still a thing or is that done now that probates are kind of done? So multiple wills are, are still a, a thing. Um, so as, as you might know, have multiple wills, sorry, is what I should have asked you. So you know, multiple wills is a strategy, you know, for people that own businesses where you would have a, a will that deals with your business assets, so your shares of corporations and your shareholder loans, 
and another will that deals with everything else, your house, your cottage, your personal investment accounts, your vehicles, things like that. Uh, this planning started in Ontario, which has some fairly high probate fees, um, because somebody, a, a bright lawyer figured out that, hey, if we create a second will that deals with your shares in a private business, we don't technically have to submit that to probate. And so there are two benefits of that. One, obviously you avoid probate fees. Um, in Manitoba, those are $7,000 per million dollars of, of value. So, you know, Rob's plumbing at a $5 million valuation, the probate fees attached to that value would be about $35,000. The other thing though, is that when documents are submitted uh, to support that grant of probate, those are accessible to anybody who wants to go to court and make a request for those documents. So um, your competitors at uh, Ron's Plumbing could go and access documents that show that, hey, on, on Rob's death, uh, Rob's Plumbing was worth $5 million. And so by having- this, right? It's like privacy. Right. Yeah. So by having multiple wills, um, you know, you save on the probate fees and you also get the privacy aspect of not disclosing the value of that business when you passed away. Now, Manitoba has proposed to eliminate probate fees on July 1st. They made that announcement in December of last year. I don't know if they're still going to go ahead with that given everything that's happening. Um, but this is a strategy that works in other provinces. Like I said, it, it originated in Ontario, which does have uh, fairly high probate fees. Um, and, and we do see this strategy in, in you know, various provinces. So um, people in other provinces, if you own private businesses, something to ask your, uh, you know, your estate planning lawyers about. Oh, I'd like to ask you uh, about, people often ask me, Rob, about what number of income should I consider incorporating? And I kind of have roughly an idea what I think. I mean, I know there's other variables to that, but let's say I'm unincorporated right now. I'm a sole proprietorship. So technically all of my income goes against Rob Tatro's personal income. What's the number that you would say, you know what, it's worth the cost to incorporate. So the cost of incorporating isn't, you know, you're not looking at uh, significant fees to just yeah, incorporate. Or something like um, that. And, and there's two answers to that question. One, I think any operating business, you know, there is the benefit of limited liability through incorporating. So in some respects, you might say no matter how much money you're making, you want to consider incorporation because of that limited liability aspect. Um, the second thing I would say is if you end up, you know, so that's, that's one answer. The second answer I might give you is if you find that you're making more money than you need and you can leave some behind in a corporation and pay tax at that 9% rate, um, there is a significant tax deferral. And once a corporation is up and running, again, not overly expensive to maintain. There are some accounting fees. There are um, some uh, you know, companies office will charge fees to file an annual return. But the, most of those costs are, are upfront. So in that scenario, also worth considering incorporating. The final scenario is if you have a business that you think you might sell one day, because in order to claim that capital gains exemption, you have to sell shares of a qualifying small business corporation. To put it another way, you, you cannot get the capital gains exemption if you don't incorporate. So like, it's not, it's Correct. a non-starter. Like you're out that eight, 880 or whatever, 870 grand. Um, you know, people often say, yeah, but all the write-offs that you get when you're incorporated, but like the actual write-offs, the expenses are your expenses, whether you're sole proprietorship or whether you're incorporated. I know there are some minor differences, but largely it's the same thing. The real benefit, you touched on it. I have the exact same answer that I tell clients is once you're accumulating cash more than you can spend, so you're profitable and you're leaving some cash in the corp, you should definitely incorporate because then that 9% is, is huge, right? Absolutely. Um, and then a, a, a Cadillac reorg, you, I think you use the world Cadillac or, or maybe I have where, you know, you're doing hold co opco, maybe an invest co, maybe a family trust with a relook at the wills and all that. 
I mean, I know it's impossible for you to give a price, but what's a typical range for something like that? If someone's watching, is like, I can't afford that. That must be a hundred grand. Um, you know, what is a typical Cadillac reorg cost? And I know you can't give an exact cost, but what's the range for those uh, for a firm like Aikens? In, in so it, it does tend to, to depend on your existing structure. And, and, you know, if you have a corporation already, what do we have to do to, um, to make sure that we can implement this reorganization? Um, and every reorganization is different in terms of, uh, you know, what are the terms of the family trust and who do you want, uh, you know, what, what sort of planning are you looking to accomplish? Um, what I tend to do because I, I spend my day doing this type of planning for people, um, you know, I, I have the luxury of, of being able to give people upfront estimates of, of what okay. this will cost once someone we have a sense of structure. Yeah. Someone comes to you and you go, I, I only have an opco right now. I need to do all this. You'd go, well, it's going to cost you X 20 grand or 15 grand or 30 or 50 or whatever, whatever the number is, you, you kind of give it to them. Yeah, so I've, I mean, I personally have a fairly good handle on how much time is involved in, in doing all of these things. Um, I don't like surprises when I go to see my mechanic or when I hire my plumber. Um, so I, uh, like I said, the, the, the nice part of these reorganizations is that it does let us give people, you know, I, I can give people upfront estimates. And I, I really think that what makes tax lawyers unique is, um, and people might roll their eyes when I say this, but um, we are an investment. Um, whatever, what, whatever, whatever we do for you, you, you know, if we do our jobs properly, you should save uh, multiples of that when it comes tax time, whether it's you know, current tax liability or tax liability on sale of your business or on on death. So um, I think there's a lot of value that we can add to people's businesses, um, you know, tax lawyers, tax accountants. So uh, very, you know, I, I encourage people to reach out to their tax advisors to, um, you know, and, and be open to suggestions on what they can do to uh, lower your tax bill, again, whether it's today or whether it's off in the future. I've, I've worked a lot with a lot of clients in my, in my career in, in the investment industry or in the wealth management world. And, you know, sometimes I think, wow, I'm so proud of myself. I, I earned 4% over the benchmark and I created a ton of returns. I was extremely tax efficient for this guy. The times that I get the biggest positive feedback in my career is always the times where I was able to do some significant tax planning advice for people and they up saving. Like I remember one of my first years, I noticed that someone didn't have the proper corp structure to get the capital gains exemption. And I mentioned it to them and they sold their business three years later. And they, you know, they sent me a bottle of wine and they were like, thank you. You saved me. Uh, what was the tax? Like 500 grand or something. And I was like, oh, you know, happy to help. So there is a lot that could be done here. And I think people likely don't realize it. So I'm hopefully people who are watching this get the idea to, to talk to us about it. And if we need to bring you in, Mike, we'll bring you in. Um, this is incredibly valuable stuff in my mind. So please do give us a like uh, or a follow on uh, YouTube or uh, Facebook. Uh, I do want to take a sec here to, to talk about our guests that are coming up on the Tatro show. I don't know if you know this, Mike, but we got some dragons coming up. We got two. Uh, on Monday, we got uh, Vincenzo Guzzo. He's CEO of Cinemas Guzzo. He's also an entrepreneur investor. He's on Dragons Den. He is quite the character. He's awesome. I saw some of his videos on BNN. Uh, I've met him already a couple of times. He, he's just a fantastic character. He's got a great outlook on uh, on business, on retail, on entrepreneurship. Really excited. He's going to have some big shoes to fill. That's Monday, coming up Monday, uh, 3 p.m. Then I got Bruce Croxon, another dragon. He's CEO of Round 13. Uh, he'll He's an entrepreneur investor. He's been on Dragons Den, was on Dragons Den for a long time, very long time. He's coming up on Monday, June 1st. 3 p.m. Central, 4 p.m. Eastern. Really excited to get some two dragons coming up. Guys, if you haven't yet, please go to your YouTube button and press subscribe. Do it right now. Just press subscribe. Subscribe. Uh, give us a like or a follow on Facebook. Uh, again, if you'd like to chat with me, go to www.speaktorob.com. We'd be happy to book a no obligation consultation. Today, May 21st, 2020, the Dow fell about 100 points. I was lucky enough to have Mike Ziesman, our guest here on the Tatro Show, tax partner at MLT Aikens. Mike, thanks so much for coming in today. To the thanks for having me. Have a fantastic weekend. Have a fantastic weekend. We will see you Monday and hopefully the market keeps rallying. Take care, stay safe and have a great weekend, guys.